Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Church at Home with Rachel for Tuesday, the 24th of September. I absolutely do know what day it is today because today is my 19th anniversary um, to marrying Rob. It was a, a, a cool, windy, gorgeous, sunny day in London, Ontario, 19 years ago today on a Saturday when we tied the knot. We got hitched, all those things. The boys wore their mosquitoes. They were three and five years old and couldn't say the word tuxedo so they kept running around telling everybody they were wearing their mosquitoes it was great fun you might have noticed i've been a bit discombobulated in trying to get these videos up and running in the last couple of days my apologies i have been running on coffee and fumes and no excuses i'm going to try my best to get myself back on track today to get situated um if i thought i wouldn't drop my computer i used to give you a spin of my office it looks like a tornado hit because I've just been going from thing to thing and um, there have all been good things. But it's been kind of like planning a wedding, trying to get everything that needs to get done on time for that moment. And then, wow, it happens. Now, I know that there are lots of you out there who have never found your person or who ch have chosen not to. That you know, getting married is not your thing. Um, and that's awesome. And it's not awesome if you want to find your person and haven't yet. I do know what that's like. I didn't meet Rob until I was 32 years old. I did not date. I had not had any high school romances or university or college romances. I was stone alone and didn't like it and was a little angry with God for quite a bit of that to say, what's going on? Looking back, I can say absolutely that, you know what, as much as I wasn't glad at the time, I am, I am looking back, I'm glad that my life happened the way it happened. There are lots of things in my life that I would look back on and say, I would never choose to do that again, but I'm glad that I had to go through it. One of them is a thing called CPE, Clinical Pastoral Education. And in becoming a priest, at least in my diocese of where I was in Huron, where I was ordained, in order to become a priest during your schooling, your master's degree, you had to take a summer where you did 13 weeks um, full time, where you paid them. <laughs> to go um, to be a chaplain, to learn how to be a chaplain in a hospital setting or in institutional setting. Some people did some prison work or things like that. Mine was in a hospital um, and it was the most difficult 13 weeks of my life. I would get up at before six every morning and drive across London, Ontario to go and leave. I don't know why, but I leave my car, my mom's car at my friend Len's house and Len would drive us. To Hamilton about two hours away and we would spend the day at Shadok Hospital and then come home and at about eight o'clock at night I get home and do my homework and get up in the morning and do it all again for 13 weeks where I worked in the Shadok Hospital long-term care care facility and in that facility I was responsible for going down the hill from the from the building where we were housed <coughs> where, oh, excuse me, where our offices were to go and to be a chaplain, to be with the people who were there, who many of them had been had car accidents or um, debilitating strokes or heart attacks that left them um, physically unable to, to live their lives on their own. They could no longer be independent. So they were living, it was almost like a nursing home for people who weren't old enough to be in a nursing home. Um, one person I worked with um, was, had MS. And at that point, that was rather, rather terrifying for me because MS, you may know, is multiple sclerosis. My grandmother had that, my grandma on my dad's side, and she wouldn't be stopped by it. She was this amazing person. Every time the doctor said, well, Le Lena, I really suggest you not do this, she would go out and do that. One time he told her she should stay home and not go any more bus trips. She went to the local travel agent and booked herself on a bus trip to, I don't know, Branson, Missouri or something, but that was who she was. She would take what they said and said, fooey on you, I'm going to do it anyway. And that's how she lived her life. Um, and she, I was glad to know her. She died when I was 11, um, but she was an amazing woman. And sometimes people say I'm a lot like her and I take that as a huge compliment. Um, but my sister also had been diagnosed with MS not much longer or not much before I went to um, Shadok's the hospital there. And I was dealing with a woman who had multiple sclerosis so badly that she was maybe 40 years old and she was completely um, unable to do anything for herself. Now, there was some question about whether she 
maybe could have, but she had emotionally and psychologically given up. She was not able, hadn't seen her child for many years, and it was difficult. And it was difficult for me to go and see her every day like that, thinking that could be my sister. Um, knowing my sister, no, never, even if Jen couldn't, you know, move her body, her mind is completely sharp and she would find ways to be. She'd find ways, she just would. But I dealt with people who were living a life that this was all they had left. They were, for the most part, there was no hope that their family was going to come and be able to take them home. These were not folks who were in transition, that they had been in a car accident and were now paraplegic or quadriplegic and were learning how to deal with life and go home. These were folks who had no resources. They were going to be there for the rest of their lives. And seeing them, watching them every day, knowing that I could walk away, I could just go home and live my life. And those four walls that they had for their rooms and their physiotherapy and the, 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 the things that people brought in for them to do, the, the volunteers and the music and things like that, that that was the sum total of what they could look forward to for the most part. And it really gave me a completely different perspective on, at that time, the loneliness of my life. It made me think in terms of being appreciative of what I have, recognizing that when there is no more that you can do about what you have, in that case in particular, when you're physically unable to do more about changing your own circumstances, and you get to that point where you accept that. Now, there were a lot of people there who were still in, the, in many of the different stages of grief, anger, denial, all that stuff, who really didn't want to be there. But for the people who had been able to live there long enough to get to the point where they realized, this is now my life, and began to make the best of it, there were people who made cards for other people. There were people who literally could do nothing physically, but they would talk to me and then they would ask me, who should I pray for today? There were people who learned really bad jokes and they would go and tell those jokes at lunch or when they were in the courtyard or something because it would make someone smile. People recognized that this was their life and they found the ability to live the best life they could within it. And for the most part, they were happy. It took me a lot of years of processing after I left my CPE unit between my first and second year of my MDiv to realize that those folks weren't just faking it, that they really had come to some sort of peace about where they were. And looking back, it was hard, um, you know, long days and incredibly long. Part of what you do in CPE is you visit with people and then you do what's called a verbatim and you go to talk to your partner, your another student or your supervisor, and you literally will talk about or write down the whole conversation as closely, as literally as you can to what was actually said so that you can go back and say, okay, how did that go? What did it make you feel when you were the chaplain? How did you feel when they said that? Um, why would you respond that way? Would you respond differently next time? Because most of it wasn't about us learning how to become chaplains or priests or pastors. It was about lo us learning about ourselves. How do I respond when someone yells at me because I can get out of my chair and walk away and they can't move their legs? How does it feel when someone curses me because they just think women shouldn't be in ministry? How does it feel when you fall in love with someone because they're just a beautiful personality and a beautiful person and after 13 weeks you have to walk away and not look back because that's your pastoral, that's your professional responsibility. It's more, the CPE is more about learning about you so that you know your own stuff before you go out in the world and impose your stuff on everybody else. It's a really good program and it's a really hard program and it's a program I never want to do again. But it is also a program I'm really glad I had to do once. Now, there are other people who do it many times and go on to become supervisors. God bless them, I couldn't. Um, but it was really powerful and important. And as I lived those years between being 26 and doing my CPE and 32 before I met my husband-to-be, that was a good six years of living in a place where I was lonely and I wanted to be married and have kids. And I came to that understanding that it's quite possible that that will never happen. And I was able to do some work, not completely, but do some work around what if this is what I'm called to do? What if I am not called to be married and have children? 
What if the single life I have is what I'm called to have for the rest of my life? How do I live in that? How do I find the joy in that? How do I get through the difficulties of that? And that CPE unit was a great piece in helping me find peace, the other kind of peace, in my life to realize that regardless of whether I married 19 years or 40 or none, regardless of whether I love my job or not, or if I even have one, I can choose in this moment to find beauty. I can choose to find grace. I can choose to find someone I can make smile with a really bad knock-knock joke. I can choose to find someone who looks like they're going to cry and offer them a shoulder. It's about the choice we make in this moment. So on this of my 19th anniversary to my husband, my choice will, this evening will to be make him oven chicken, which is the only real recipe I can make without killing him. And he really likes it. And I can do the laundry and clean up the kitchen because I haven't done that in a while. I can do those little simple things to really celebrate in this moment. And I can give thanks for the incredible gifts God has given me, knowing that they're not all great. Two years ago today, we had just been told that my husband was probably going to die, that his heart was failing. They didn't know why. And in that moment, I realized unexpected graces, and I am living that way now. Every moment is an unexpected grace. Those moments when I was single, looking back, were unexpected graces. So as you go about your day, as you go about your week, even if you are in a really difficult place, even if you're struggling to find where God is or where you can find your peace, look for unexpected graces. Look for those moments when you can realize that you maybe don't have the world the way you want it, but you have life. Right now you can breathe and you can look up and you can see the beauty of God's creation. And in that moment, may that be enough. And then may you have another moment where that is enough and on and on. We really need to be able to see that regardless of where it might have been or where we wish it was, in this moment, we have this moment and we need to make the most of it. Have a great day. God bless you all. And I will see you again tomorrow because I will stop recording and, re and release this for today and then I'll record tomorrow's. Okay, so I'll get back on track. God bless you all. Have a great day.